Hello, good morning and welcome to Newsdex. We're live on the SV channel 4 to 1. Go to the channel 1 to 5 across all our social media handles where Joan is on TV. Coming up within the next 60 minutes, stop Galam say or there will be no food to eat. A warning from the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana to government as it joins calls for an end to illegal mining. Also coming up, crunch time for the Ghana Bar Association as it elects a new leader today. We're live in Kumasi for details. We'll would also analyze government's commitment to improving science, technology, engineering and mathematics with its STEM innovation drive. All this within the next 60 minutes. My name is Faustina Sapo. Please take a seat and be my guest. Thanks for choosing us. We're your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. Now, this morning, there is pressure on government to intensify its fight against illegal mining. Over the past two weeks, many civil society organizations have sent warnings to government to find a way to halt the menace or face the wrath. The Asante Hini, or 2482 II, has also added his voice to calls to end the menace. Today, organized labor and the media coalition against illegal mining are holding a meeting to decide on the way forward following warning release letters they issued earlier. Well, the Peace and Farmers Association of Ghana has joined the call to ban illegal mining. They say that the menace threatens the survival of farmers and food security. They also highlight that over the past few years, illegal mining has led to the loss of more than 1.2 million hectares of farmland. Now, we've been joined by Awal Ado. He is the national president of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Thank you so much for your time here on Newsdex. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'm told that you're on the ground currently engaging farmers who have been impacted by illegal mining. Tell us about where you are right now and what they've been telling you. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning to your viewers and listeners. Good morning, Awal. I'm currently, yeah, I'm currently in the western region of mm. Ghana. Mm. Yeah. So um, I'm in the Zimai area. Of course, we've been having engagement with some farmers over there for some time now. Mm. Um, last about two months ago, we had some Indian partners who came around. Their interest was supposed to uh, support irrigation for rice farming, particularly in the Lembele district of the Western region. We visited a community that is a Kangoli community. They have a river there called the Fia River. And that river is supposed to be used to, uh, what, what do you call it? That river is supposed to supply water to the irrigation dam. That, uh, but as we speak currently, the river is polluted Oh, well, we seem to have lost connection to you. If you just tune in, we're talking about the impact on illegal mining and we're speaking to the Farmers Association, the Peasant Farmers Association, as they are joining calls to end illegal mining. The um, Awal is currently in the Western region. He's been engaging some of the farmers. Awal, I'm hoping I have better con connection to you now. Unfortunately, I don't. But then you can still join the hashtag on all our social media handles. We are fighting illegal mining the best way we can as the media with the hashtag no to illegal mining. Now, no to Galam say. Um, I'm hoping how Wal is back. Do I have him now? That's Unfortunately. Awal, is that you? Okay, I'm hoping your connection is better now. You're just telling me you've been engaging farmers in the western region. What have they been tell telling you? Unfortunately, Awal's connection isn't favorable, but we'll try and reach him because the Peasant Farmers Association are joining calls for government to immediately end illegal mining. We told you earlier that the lands minister... Um, have decided to engage stakeholders as they look at effective methods of putting an end to illegal mining. 
And let's take you now away from that as we still work the lines to get back a while. It is a decision-making time for lawyers in Ghana as they go to the polls to elect a president, Ifagate and um, Jack Basu are in a keen contest to see who replaces Yao Echampumba for as the Ghana Bar Association president Ifagate is competing for the third time while Agbesi Jakpasu is contesting for the first time. Let's take you live to Kumasi. My colleague Nana Bwachi Adam is our man on the ground. He joins us live with more. Nana, how is the process going so far? Well, firstly, we are currently live from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, the Great Hall, where the Ghana Bar Association will be having the election to elect a new president for the association. Um, over 2,500 lawyers are expected to participate in the election process today. And the two main contenders are Kwesi Jakpasu and then um, lawyer Ifua Gate. Well, a little bit of profile of these two candidates. Lawyer Ifua Gate has contested for the presidency of the Ghana Bar Association before. She contested against the incumbent president, um, lawyer um, Yao Buafo, um, in 2021, but then lost to um, lawyer Yao Buafo. Uh, during that particular election. Well, she is also um, a co-founder of the Gatti and Gatti, and she was also called to the bar in 1999, her profile, uh, 1991, and that is when she was called to the bar. A little bit of profile of um, lawyer Efua Gatti, and she is the um, immediate past president of the Greater Accra branch of the Ghana Bar Association. For the second time, she's contesting for the presidency of the Ghana Bar Association, and this time around, she's coming against um, um, her junior, a nine-year-old junior um, lawyer, Kwesi Jakpasu, who is also um, a member of the Ghana Bar Association. He was called to the bar in 2000, and he is also contesting against lawyer Ifua Gate this time around. And so um, the horses are ready for battle. And so at exactly 9.15, as announced by the Electoral Commission of the Ghana Bar Association, the process will begin. But it is going to be an electronic process um, at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where over 2,500 lawyers will be participating in the voting process. But then I have some two lawyers here with me who will be sharing their thoughts on, on this particular process. Um, their expectation with regards to this electoral process, the Ghana Bar Association going into this election. Well, I must say that the process and the conference started on Monday and it is also going to end on Sunday. They are going to close it with the Akwesi Day celebration. On Monday, the President of the Republic, Nanado Dankwa Kufuado, a special guest of honor, and the Asante Hine, who was the guest of honor, graced the occasion here at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Today being Wednesday, the Ghana Bar Association is having the election to elect a new president who is going to take over from the incumbent president, lawyer Yao Boafo. And so I'll start with the lady on my left, and then she's also going to tell us what her expectations are with regards to this particular electoral process. Um, you first tell off with, start off with your name, and then let's talk about this particular electoral process. What are your expectations? Thank you very much. My name is Frida Niwa Boateng, and um, my expectations for this election is that it would be massively participated in by all the lawyers who have registered. Unfortunately, we, we, we had wished that every member who was in good standing would have had opportunity to vote, but that has not been the case. So we are praying that people will show up in their numbers and then to vote, and particularly to vote for Ifua Gati. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that this election would be free, this election will be fair and will be transparent, and the results will be accepted by all candidates because we believe in the our electoral process so these are my expect expectations today i'll still come back to you but then i have to also speak to um another lawyer from my right um, council now you have observed the um conference since it began on monday the president was here um the aspirants who are seeking to take over from the incumbent president um lawyer yawa champo Buafo, have also um engaged the lawyers here um, ahead of the electoral process which is expected to start at 11 15. what are your expectations you first start off with your name my name is andrew Carte. And let me say that um, the Ghana Bar Association organizes annual conferences every year. However, every three years we elect new leaders to man the affairs of the association. 
Um, it, may, it may surprise you to know that in very recent years, about a thousand lawyers are called to the bar every year. What this means is that we now record almost 8,000 lawyers uh, um, at the bar. Now, over the past few months, over the past few months, the candidates have rigorously and vigorously gone across the lengths and breadths of the country to ensure that they are able to enter every law firm, every region, every legal department to sell their messages to everyone. I believe that this is an opportunity for all lawyers to take a decision which will positively impact the bar because if not for anything at all, the Ghana Bar Association is a very classic example of what a fine professional association should be. So all eyes are on us. All eyes of the Ghana Bar Association, as I said earlier, um, over 2,500 lawyers are expected to participate in the electoral process today. Not long ago, the two aspirants um, delivered their vision to the lawyers inside the Great Hall Auditorium. And uh, fast forward, the process is expect, expected to, to begin. But then I'll still come back to you, uh, Council. If we look at the politics of today, the Ghana Bar Association, many say, has gone into the, the Ghana's recent politics so much that it has been politicized. That's an association which is expected to be neutral. Do you believe in these things that people do say about the Ghana Bar Association? I, I do not believe that the Ghana Bar Association has been politicized. What I believe in is that the Ghana Bar Association is an association that speaks for the voiceless. It's an association that is supposed to help the helpless. It is an association that has helped the democracy of this country and has brought us this far as a democratic nation and we are determined to continue in that path. What we are, are a competent and a united association. What we are looking to vote for is someone who unites us, and there is no place for politics in the Bar Association. If there be any elements or any persons who seek to politicize the Ghana Bar Association, um, I, I am happy to inform them that they will not succeed because... Is it, is it going to be, is it still going to have the reputation if your candidate takes over? Of course. Why not? My candidate is dedicated to lead the association in an independent manner, not an appendage to any political party. She is a resolute woman, a woman of a good track record. Her long service to the bar has demonstrated that whether um, she has worked under a government that is led under the NDC or a government that is led under the MPP, she has just worked for the bar, simpliciter. There has never been any time that she has refused to work with anybody in the bar because the person belonged to a, a party A or party B. I do not see how that will change when she becomes president of the bar. Politics has no place in the bar. We can do our politics outside. Here we are lawyers who are seeking after the welfare of the nation. That is our determination as a bar and that is the determination of my candidate, Ifwagati. Thank you very much. But fast forward, as we um, go into the electoral process, it is expected to begin at 11.15. Um, are you expecting a free and fair electoral process from the Electoral Commission? All right, so let me begin by saying that um, in the last elections in 2021 at Borga, the Ghana Bar Association commenced with the electronic voting. However, in 2021, there was a mixture of both the electronic voting and manual voting. Fast forward, in tune with the times, the Ghana Bar Association has fully instituted electronic voting. I would want to believe that the Bar Association, which is pretty much aware of the tenets of a free and fair election, would ensure that the election is free, is fair, and is smooth. I, I would not want to think to think otherwise. Are you are you prepared? I mean, is your candidate really prepared for the electoral process, which is expected to start very soon? I'm sure you have already mentioned that my candidate is standing elections again. Indeed, this is the third time Ifwagate is standing for the presidency of the Ghana Bar Association. The first one in 2018, 2021, and 2024. If there is any horse which is more prepared for this race, it can be no other person than Ifwagate. Thank you very much. And so these are two lawyers um, who are currently here. They are from the camp of Ivo Agate. Um, going forward, they've shared their vision from their candidates and also um, their expectation with regards to um, the Ghana Bar Association and its presidency when it is being taken over by their candidates and also the fact that the electoral process is going to be free and fair and how hopeful they are that their candidate is going to emerge victorious. But I must say that this is the annual conference 
conference of the Ghana Power Association uh, Wednesday, which the association is expected to have its election to elect a new president who will take over from the incumbent president, lawyer Yao Echampon Boafo, who has served his three term. Um, Ifwa Gati is contesting again. She is the immediate past president of the Greater Accra um, Associate, branch of the Ghana Bar Association. And she is also a founder of the Gati and Gati. She was called to the bar in 1991. She's coming up against her opponent, Kwesi Jakpasu, who also um, was called to the bar in 2000. And he's, this is actually his first time contesting for the position as president of the Ghana Bar Association. The president of the association, the current president, I must say, when delivering his remarks during um, the opening of the annual conference, emphatically said that these, as, uh, these candidates should desist from giving out promises that they cannot um, give out when they are elected president of the association. Um, we are also monitoring their campaign messages as long as this particular election is concerned. And at exactly 11.15, when the electoral process begins, we would bring you up to speed details to it. It is going to be an electronic process. As you heard from the lawyers in Borga, it was an electronic and a manual process. But this time around, the association has decided to go by an electronic, strictly an electronic process. And so over 2,500 lawyers are expected to participate in this particular election. This is the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, the Great Hall to be specific, where lawyers are inside listening to their um, leadership as we prepare for their election, which is expected to start at exactly 11.15. Chi Adam, we're back at you at that time to get updates on that event and how it pans out. But let's take you back to our earlier story. We're speaking to the Peasant Farmers Association. Awal Ado is national president, and they were just sharing the thoughts about illegal mining. Um, he's currently in the Western region. Thankfully, I have better connection to Awal. Awal, you've been engaging some farmers there. What have they been telling you? Like I indicated earlier, we have been engaging our members mm. in the communities in the western region. I'm currently in Elambele district. Mm. And like I indicated earlier, the, there's a river in the western in the region, in the Elambele district, called the Fia River. The community was expected to use that river for irrigation because they have some farmlands around and they are looking at putting those lands into rice cultivation. Luckily for us, about three months ago, we had some Indian partners who came from India, and they were interested in helping this community to get the, pro the dam properly constructed so that we can draw water from the Fia River to the dam and use it for the irrigation. As I speak to you, that river is highly polluted, is virtually destroyed by Galamsey activities. I pass through Ancobra River. Our members over there are also complaining because some of them are vegetable farmers. They used to fetch water from the Ancobra River to water their vegetables. As I speak to you, that river too is highly polluted because of Galamsey activities. You go to the Shama district, go to all those places. The Pra River is there. I visited our members there. Of course, the last time I was there, that's, <clears throat> they indicated to me how they were also fetching the water for domestic activities, how they were fetching the water for irrigation purposes. As I speak, all those water bodies are contaminated, all those water bodies are polluted as a result of irrigation activities. And you know, these communities are along the coast, this district, that is the Shama, Inzima East, Jomoro, Elembele. And those communities along the coast, as we speak, you know, they don't have a lot of land because Part of their land already has been taken for oil and gas activities. So the land that is left for agriculture activities is limited. So if we have limited land along these coastal districts for agriculture activities, and the land is also being destroyed by the activities of illegal mining, then I'm afraid very soon activities, agriculture activities along the coast is going to be seriously affected. That is why we want government to do something about what is going on. If nothing is done, then I'm afraid very soon those districts along the coast and western region will not have any place to grow food crops for this country. What exactly do you want government to do? Because Operation Vanguard, for example, was established to put an end to illegal mining. But then what specific things would your association want government to do at mm -hmm. this time? Exactly. So for us, we want government to immediately place a ban 
on the galaxy activities. We Illegal are mining is already in banned in this country. However, are you pushing for small-scale mining as well? Exactly. You know, mm. from the, if you look at the activities now, when you go to the ground, it's mm. difficult to distinguish which one is, is a small-scale mining and which one is an illegal mining activity. Mm. And that is why we are joining other stakeholders that for now, there should be a ban and all stakeholders should be brought together, the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, the EPA and other stakeholders. They need to call all of them to sit together and say, look, these areas are no-go areas. You understand that? This is a red line. These are forest reserves, these are rivers. Until we do that, it's going to be very difficult for us to be able to fight this. So for us and our situation, we also join the force that there should be an immediate call on all these activities along the rivers and then the forest reserves. We need to take that immediate step in the first place. And then after looking at all that, we were even educating our members in the community. Any action, any activity that will be taken to stop illegal mining, we are urging our farmers across the country to join any action that will be taken to stop that. Because some of them have lost their farmlands. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they, these illegal miners to be used force to take the land from the people. You understand? You come, they try to buy the land from you. Sometimes there is some resistance by these, uh, by these smallholder farmers. The next time there's an excavator on your farm. And these people are so powerful that they, the peasant farmers can virtually do nothing about it. So we are also calling for an immediate ban, and there should be a stakeholder meeting. And then areas that have been designated for farmlands, there should be no mining activity on farmlands that have been reserved for the production of food for this country. And but we you are watching agree. what is going to happen. Mm, you would agree that a minute part of the problem is that sometimes farmers also sell their lands to illegal miners because they feel it is more lucrative. That's a concern Cocoa Board raised as far back as the beginning of this year when we started seeing a decline in cocoa production. As an association, what are you also doing to bridge that gap? Exactly. So what we're doing is that we have to educate our members mm. that, look, if you give the land out for these illegal activities, Gold is not something they are going to mine forever. They will mine the gold on the land. Maybe for the meantime, you may be getting some money. But if they exhaust that place or if they can no longer find the gold there, by the time they leave the place, they would have devastated the land, the ecosystem, the soil fertility. Everything will be destroyed. So where do you go back after that place? So we are educating them that they should not give their land out. Of course, some of them out of frustration. You know, farming already, they are facing so many difficulties in the system. The, the cost of inputs and all those things. So if they are facing so many challenges and they are induced with money, a number of them try to give out the farmland. Others too, the illegal miners use force to confiscate the land from them. We also have our members telling us that sometimes they try to induce them with money when they resist. The next time you see excavators on the farm. And these are uh, uh, poor people usually in the communities and the villages. So we will continue with our education that illegal mining on farmlands is not the way to go. Because when the gold is finally exhausted on that land, you may have to go back there to do farming. And where are you going to do the farming? The ecosystem would have been destroyed, the environment is destroyed, and it's going to affect all of us. And we are much particular. Look at food inflation in the country. Mm -hmm. If you look at the general inflation that we have been battling with, if you segregate it, food inflation is always leading in terms of the component. So if we are struggling to grow food, we are struggling to make Ghana become self-sufficient in food production, mm. and farmlands are being destroyed with, the, with this level of impunity, then I'm afraid Ghana will have to rely heavily on import of food in the future. And mm. normally we look at the, the projections that are being made. Mm. If our population is expected to hit about 50, 54 million by 2050, what it means is that we are going to have many more mass to feed in this country. And to be able to feed these people, we need land to grow food. And if we need land to grow food and we are destroying the land, by the time we reach 54 million people in 2050, then I'm afraid it's going to be a disaster. And, and, and we can't sit and watch. We would have been failing the future generation. And that is why I want government to take action now. All our illegal activities on farmlands, on cocoa farms, in water bodies, in forest reserves, there should be an immediate ban. Of course, we're saying that there's already a ban on it. But it seems the ban is not working. Mm. So we want them to enforce that ban immediately and take all this call to the table to find a way forward. Because we can't continue like this. We can't continue like this. Our and as we wrap up the conversation, point the noted, as we wrap up the conversation, unfortunately, we have to. Um, it's been two weeks exactly since government 
um, placed a ban on the export of rice, soybeans and maize as part of measures to mitigate the impact of dry spell on our economy and also food supply. Um, they also announced a raft of measures to help farmers who may be feeling the pinch of the dry spell. You are on the grounds engaging farmers. So far, have you received the 1,000 CD per acre that government promised? Yeah, um, we have not received the 1,000 CD per acre yet because we had the problem mm. with the data that government put up earlier. Because government has put up some information earlier and, 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 and that they were going to work with that data. So we have a problem with that data in the first place. And then the secondly, we were not in support of that ban because these cereals, bills, and other uh, food that the government was funded. Mm. Nobody supported the farmers. But it's the already been implemented, so we want to see measures now that are put in place by government to mitigate the impact on you farmers. Do you think is effective so far? For example, government told you that you could sell some of your produce to them. Um, with your data so far, has any of your members sold to government and at how much? For us, as long as we are aware, we have not um, had any report of our members selling to government. Okay. Because in the first place, we had a problem with that measure. And this was because government should have made the stakeholders to negotiate and agree on, we needed to have what we call minimum guarantee price. At what price are we going to sell to government? Mm -hmm. You don't come out and then implement a ban and say we should sell to government. At what price? Because the farmers are bearing a high cost of production. There was no subsidy for them. Nobody supported our members to be able to produce food. So if we are not being supported and we have to bear the brunt of high prices of inputs in the market to produce this food, and you are placing a ban, secondly, you are telling us to go and sell to government at what price? So these measures that they are putting in place, we seriously disagree with them. That is why we expect government to come to the ground, engage stakeholders, engage the farmers on the ground, mm. so that we see the way forward. The ban is not going to work because, like I said, uh, nobody supported us to produce our food stuff. Mm. We produce that at a high cost. So how we are going to sell it to make our margins and sustain our business is very key to us. Secondly, um, government did not engage us to give us a guarantee price that we are supposed to sell this particular food stuff to, to, to MOFA. To the so are you encouraging your members to boycott engagement. government because they failed to engage at the initial stages? Is that the case? Yes, because there was no engagement. There was no engagement at the initial stage. Mm. And that is why these measures outlined by government, especially the ban, especially the ban, we totally disagree with government on that ban. Mm. We totally disagree with them. And then again, we have a problem with the data that government was presenting. So we expect that government should get in touch with the directors of food and agriculture at the various district level to be able to pick concrete data from the farmers because we have a problem with that information. And that is why we in the Peasant Farmers Association, like I indicated earlier, we have not received any form of support mm -hmm. in terms of the production. We are buying inputs at high prices in the market, and we will not sit down and allow this to happen to our members, not to be able to sell their food products. Some have already received money from people across, I mean, from our neighbors, to be able to produce enough, enough food to supply them. So if I receive money from somebody in Burkina Faso or from Togo to produce Togo or whatever, and now you are saying I can't sell to that farm, to that person, I have to sell to government, and I've not even negotiated a minimum guarantee price. At what price are we selling? So we look at the whole measures that we put in place that it is quite problematic. Mm. So government has to go back and re-engage. The mm. stakeholders are there, we are there, we can sit on the table with government mm. to, to do re-engagement and mm. look at all these measures that government is putting in place, whether it's really going to ensure that we become self-sufficient in food production. But as we as farmers mm. on the ground, the measures we think are not going to solve any problem. These measures announced by government will not solve any problem. Thank you, Awal Ado. We have to move on from the conversation. In subsequent bulletins, we'll be expanding this conversation as we look at the impact of dry spell because the agric ministry warned us that it will happen in September. We're in that month already. And so we'll be expanding the conversation. Now let's talk about education because the Ministry of Education in 2021 introduced a competition of ideas among senior high school, senior high technical schools and TVET institutions across the country to find lasting solutions to problems in their communities for social economic development 
in the country. Now, it's been three years since that STEM innovation drive was instituted. The question we're asking this morning is what has been achieved so far? We have in the studio spokesperson for the Ministry of Education, Kwesi Kwasing. Thank you for your time here on Newsdex. Hey, thank you, Fosti. It's glad to see you in person. We mostly do Zoom. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, we just take advantage of technology. But this time around, I felt that I needed to come to, I mean, throw more light into the project, particularly mm when we also have some videos to show. Great. Now, we also have Nana Sikamensa. She is Deputy National Coordinator for the Free Senior High School um, Program and Project Lead for STEM Innovation. Nanafra, thank you so much for your time here. Thank you for having me. On Newsdex. I, I will come to you shortly, but let me start with Gracie because we've missed him. Um, what's the update, <laughs> STEM Innovation? How far have we come? Three years. What's the impact so far? Yeah, I think the premise is also equally important. Mm. Because largely, if you look at the global trends in development, mm. you realize that there is a very strong correlation or link between education and socioeconomic transformation. And all over the world that you have seen development or socioeconomic fortunes turn around, obviously the basis or the focus for that development came from education. And I have always followed my boss and even listened to the conversation that he has been making all over. Mm. He makes a case that countries that have even hit the in terms of the, uh, the gross station enrollment ratio being up to 40%, that country develops automatically. Mm. If you cite cases like, for instance, uh, Singapore, 40%, it develops. Botswana, 40%. America, 76%, it develops. And of course, if you look at countries like South Korea, around 96% is also developed. But of course, it's not just any other education, but education that is relevant to the socioeconomic transformation. And so if you look at education, for instance, you are looking at particularly three main key uh, pillars or variables. You are looking at access, you are looking at quality, you are looking at relevance. And so when access meets quality, and quality obviously is the kind of education that you are giving to your people, that is where you will be able to achieve relevance, which translates into the socioeconomic uh, fortune. So our world, I mean, if you ask me, is gradually changing. Mm. If you look at all over the world, I mean, particularly taking the context from the first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution, where Africa or third world countries do not take advantage of it. We believe that particularly within the fourth industrial revolution, where we are talking about robotics, artificial intelligence, internet of things, 3D imaging, we as a ministry have to reposition Ghana's education to be able to take advantage of the global trends and make sure that we are able to train students who are not just only readers and writers, but they are critical thinkers, they are accessible. They are problem solvers, and not just ordinary problem solvers, but they are able to identify problems within their local space, use local materials to be able to solve such uh, uh, local problems. So when we talk about the concept of STEM innovation, what essentially we mean is that we are now realigning with the global trends in mm -hmm. terms of our educational landscape. And therefore, we are repositioning education to fit into 21st century, which means that we've introduced STEM. But STEM innovation essentially saying that it's only about STEM being theorizing within the classroom, but STEM putting into practice. So STEM innovation essentially means that you are practicalizing ideas to be able to solve problems within particular society or locality. And that's quite interesting for me because to a large extent, the concern we've had from a lot of um, educationists is that our system is more theoretical than practical. Exactly. So I'll come to Nana to tell us more about what you're doing because as coordinator for the free SHS program, you have had the opportunity to engage a lot of young people and their thoughts about merging STEM with innovation. Tell us more about that. All right, thank you for, for having me. You mm. know, looking at uh, the investments we are investing into the free senior high school space, mm. we thought it wise that we will not allow this investment to go waste. So why then don't we bring something practical on the table for students to I mean, develop problem solving uh, solutions to the issues that we are facing as a country? Trust me, during our first edition, RARA, a community in Uti region, realized that teachers and nurses were not accepting postings to some deprived communities. And then they decided to bring something practical. You know, they, they, it was something like a rural electrification. And then market women, nurses who were not accepting postings to those communities were able to get light. And it was all solar light. So uh, 
our investment shouldn't go waste. We need to challenge these students to bring something practical on board. That is why the STEM innovation came about. So it's simply a competition among high schools for them to identify a problem within their community and then find lasting solutions to them. Now we come to you, Kwesi. Yeah. Identifying problems, that's to a large extent what these children would be doing. Yeah. So tell us more about that. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you look at the whole landscape of the world economy, it's all about identification of problems and then professing solutions to them. Mm. And as you profess solutions to them, I mean, it creates employment in terms of uh, areas of health, in terms of areas of agriculture, is able to really change the narrative and brings about development. That's what we call socioeconomic transformation. Particularly, if you want to look back, for instance, during the first industrial revolution in the year 1769, you realize that there was the invention of the steam engine, obviously to solve a societal problem, to increase mass production. Then you move to the second industrial revolution, which was in the year 1870, where also there was the invention of electricity to also, I mean, support industries and power machines. Of course, then it graduated to also the third industrial revolution in the year 1969, where there was also the invention of computers to also be able to help with mass production. So at every point, if you look at the global dynamics, the trend has always been where there is a problem in terms of uh, if you want to increase productivity in the areas of agriculture, in the areas of health, in the areas of climate change, in the areas of biotechnology, such problems obviously will have to require innovative response and innovative ideas to be able to respond to them. So I gave one video to your producer. If we look at, for instance, recently the conversation that is going on, particularly within our, 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 our health space, I mean, you guys brought it up. Mm. with regards to dialysis and the mm. fact that, I mean, there are even some moments you go, people or patients are unable to pay. You have a school like Obwase Secondary Technica who has invented a solar panel dialysis machine. Mm. So obviously, ultimately, you ask yourself that what will even motivate them to do so? First of all, they have to identify a problem within, I mean, that locality or that vicinity. And such a problem is that people are unable to afford dialysis. But of course, you, you, the identification of the problem alone is not enough. You will have to profess solutions to it. And professing solutions to it will mean that you will have to identify resources that you will have to use to be able to respond to such a problem. Of course, there is a component where you may even have to rely on importation to be able to gather or assemble some of the resources. But we make sure that throughout this competition, the whole concept is that you are able to use maximum 90% of the local resources to be able to respond to societal problems. So the machine you see on our screens mm. was designed by Obwase Secondary Technica High, which obviously is a very uh, strong and innovative response to the problem of, uh, I mean, patients who have to uh, get the services of dialysis so in our hospitals. So what happens then moving forward once they come up with this innovation? Does government fund it so that we can start seeing it in our hospitals so that it is not just at the school level? Yeah, I mean, the question of sustainability is always very fundamental. Mm. Uh, because, yes, uh, initially it was just about just uh, theoretical aspects of education. And I side with my boss, Dr. Osedu, when he said that you cannot memorize yourself out of poverty. Mm. So it means that you have to put those memorizations into practice and practicalize it to be able to respond to societal problems. And so questions of sustainability here is very important. And there's a more reason why as of now we are on platforms like this to also explore, I mean, industry and corporate Ghana and even the entire world to be able to also take up some of these uh, innovative yes. ideas so that, I mean, when it comes to matters of copyright, patenting, they can escalate it into mass production so that it becomes uh, 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 the, the propriety or the property of not only the, the students, but I mean, there can be shared responsibility, but ultimately, which will have a higher benefit on society. Mm. So we are exploring those ideas. Uh, we are in talks with uh, other organizations. Of course, some of the feedbacks uh, are, have been very great, but I'm sure uh, subsequently we should be able to communicate the, the, the powerful in terms of the continuity. But uh, this is also an opportunity once again to also appeal to corporate Ghana, particularly the, those in, within the industry to also come on board. Because if we look at countries, developed countries, it's rather industry who even comes up with such research proposals, particularly looking at the areas that they want to research into to be able to solve problems. Then they pitch it to these students. Students, at the end of the day, come out with an innovative response. Then they embrace those ideas. So we can also replicate the same. 
at the, at the moment, we are having institutions like NEP, which is also a government institution, which is also helping. But I mean, if you look at the mandate of NEP vis-a-vis uh, -vis this one, you may also need more hands to be able to also come on to ensure that there is continuity and sustainability. It also raises a bigger question about what we're doing with some of the research, especially in tertiary institutions lying in our shelves. Is this something that government will look at so that we can see our work, our research work on the ground actually working for us? Yeah. Well, well, so like I, like I indicated, mm. we admit mm. that as a, as a society, there is that uh, corporate gap, mm. uh, particularly if you look at research and how those research are utilized for the overall impact on our socioeconomic transformation. And it is something that, I mean, as a country, we have to look on. But particularly with reference to this one, <laughs> ultimately, these are inventions and innovations. Most questions that one will ask before coming on board is the originality of the invention. And I mean, if you look at this, I'm just for the first time hearing that we are witnessing a solar powered mm. <laughs> uh, uh, dialysis machine. Mm. So, I mean, it's a more reason why we believe that corporate society should also come on board, industry should come on board. To be able, of course, we are also reaching out to some to be able to ensure that we maintain the sustainability and continuity of uh, some of these innovative responses that are coming up. But of course, as a country, largely or broadly, we should once again look at the correlation or the balance between researches and mm. the impact on socioeconomic transformation. Because you cannot just research, identify a problem, prefer solutions to it. And some way, somehow, even when it comes to policy directives and policy directions, mm. they may not necessarily be factored into account. It's something that, as a country, we have to look at that side. Mm. Of I'll come back to you, Chris, but let me go to Nana, because um, I'm seeking to look at the gap between rural schools and most of them, their science labs, mostly empty. And so if I am competing with a school in the greater Accra region, mostly largely resourced, that's a gap. How are you bridging that gap? No, it may interest you to know that mm. when it comes to our competition, mm. it's, uh, we bring all schools on board from category A to category C. Mm. Even last year, our winner, the one who won was from category C school, a school in Ahafo, Ahafo, my community. Mm. Uh, no, it's not a community, it's a Ahafo, my senior high technical school. They won. Mm. Looking at the project that they are doing, we are not looking at those that are well resourced before we give them a, a topic for, or a team for them to develop a project on it. It's a general problem. So we don't need those with the big science labs and those, the less endowed schools for them to come on board to compete in the competition. Mm -hmm. Every school is entitled to come on board and then do the competition. So you, you may even ask, why is it that maybe the Wegehe's and then the Achimotes, why didn't they win, but rather a school in a half a mind won? Mm -hmm. That shows that we want to bring everybody on board. So as we wrap up the conversation, give us details. When is this year's event happening? All right, this year event is, we are done with the road show. Mm. And then, so we are putting our, our materials or our resources together. So the grand finale will be happening at the University of Ghana. We are still working on the venue, which will be announced later by next week. We are looking at 30th to 2nd of, uh, 30th of September to 2nd October. That is where the whole program will start. And we'll be looking forward to that. Kwesi, yes. I can't let you go without getting updates. Waek has been on your neck in recent times. They say you owe them money. How much have you paid? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it was really Waek. It was, it was the minority in parliament who were acting as spokesperson <laughs> for Waek. But of course, we will, we, we, I mean, act as though they were doing it in good faith. Uh -huh. Because ultimately, Waek ought to be paid. But I mean, for Sina, mm. what is most important to understand is that if you look at government working with its agencies mm -hmm. at every point government will owe its agencies because government do not give money for you to go and work you go and work and later on you come and i mean claim your uh, reimbursement that's how it's always been and we have had that relationship with WIAC for so long a time just last week we released an amount of 15 million ghana cities to WIAC. so that is the good news aspect mm -hmm. and so this whole but how much are you still owing I am unable <laughs> to state that off head. Of course, I'll have to verify and confirm to you. Mm. But I mean, admittedly, at every point, we'll still owe why because they render services and the services is not, it's not an event, it's a process. You have, I mean, certain examination questions, marking, 
bringing the script and as of now <laughs> they are just marking so mm. certainly we'll still order because the work has not even terminated fully mm. but our resolve is that we at every point gives enough um, or makes enough provision for them to be able to do their work just like last week when we gave that amount of 15 million so i mean parents should not be alarmed mm. we have a very good relationship with wayek we have been paying wayek and wayek is in a very good standing and good position to be able to deliver that's the most important. But their concern is about the delay in disbursement. No, that was is not it the case that the Ministry of Education is broke? Oh, I'm not sure that is the case. Mm. Uh, like I indicated earlier, mm. I mean, if, I'm not a procurement expert, but largely how government businesses are run, you, you work before we pay you. Mm. So at every point, there will be some outstanding areas that the government may have to clear. Mm. It does not necessarily mean that government owes and is not willing to pay. Mm. Government takes responsibility that when there are even any outstanding areas, they are willing to pay. And especially, I indicated the same to you, that in the interest of good faith, mm. we even just paid an amount of uh, 50, 50 million, million. See this, uh, just last week. So, I mean, there is no cause for alarm. We, every parent and everyone should be relaxed. Uh, students are going to get their, their results and they will be in school. Uh, hopefully, even in terms of the WASI, even though uh, we are not very confirmed with the date. Maybe around October, we should see students hopefully be in school. So there is no cause for alarm. Parents should be very calm. But for now, what we are pushing is term novation. Yes, science and math quiz has been very fantastic. It's been something that is, has trended. We've really gotten the publicity and attention. But I mean, beyond that, there is also the bit of innovation. You can theorize it, you can put out there, you can memorize, you can do all the calculations within your head. But we as a people believe that beyond that, we have to put it into practical mm. application. That's what STEM innovation represents. Well, Kwesi Kwarteng, spokesperson for the Education Ministry, has been my guest today. I also had Nana Afrasikamensa, Deputy National Coordinator for the Free SHS Program and Project Lead for STEM innovation. My name is Faustina Safa. We'll be back with more. Just stay tuned in.